Aloha. Aloha. Um, welcome board members and managers to the April 26, 2021 regular board meeting of the Board of Water Supply. My name is Brian Nadaya, board chair, and I'm joining the meeting via WebEx today. It's my first time. Um, I did get my second COVID shot uh, yesterday and decided to play it extra safe and stay home uh, for today. Um, I'd like to take a moment to take a roll call of the board members also joining uh, via WebEx. Uh, we have an all WebEx board today. <laughs> um, I think only the only um, manager and department is in the boardroom. But please say aye when I call your name. Vice Chair of the Post Pro. Aye. Board member Racy. Back, uh, board member Max Sword. Present. Board member Nalehu Anthony. Aye. Board member Jade Butai. Board member Roger Babcock. Present. Okay, uh, Madam Secretary, please uh, note attendance. Um, uh, as uh, the board members uh, confirmed, and um, as more members uh, join up, uh, please uh, let me know, and we can certainly get them on the record as well. Uh, uh, Chair, I think uh, board member Ray Soon has joined us. Okay. Um, we will, um, board member Ray Soon, um, could you acknowledge? Here, I'm here. Sorry. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect member soon uh, is um, present as well. All right. So board members, including myself, who are calling or video conferencing in, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, today, more than ever, since we're all remote, uh, it's really important that when you speak, um, after you unmute your um, microphone, before starting to speak, please identify yourself um, a couple of you sound almost the same. Um, if you have a question, enter a motion or second motion on an action item, make a comment. Um, uh, it would really, really help the record if you could identify yourself. In the room over there at the boardroom uh, is our manager, Ernest Lau, board secretary. Aloha. Thank you. Board secretary, Joy Cruz, that's you. and Information Specialist, Steven Nordstrom. On the telephone are Jeff Lau and Jessica Wong, both from the City County Corporation Council Department. All right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna get started today, but before we actually get into the business, um, I would note that we are taking, um, still following Governor Ige's 19th supplementary Proclamation uh, dated um, April 9th, 2021, related to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, we will also um, be discussing, um, uh, hopefully for the next month, um, how we can incorporate um, uh, Mayor Blangiardi's um, order uh, presently that applies to the city and county um, that, uh, that will allow uh, uh, tier three um, so we, we are exploring that at this time. For now, for this meeting, testimony can be submitted as follows. Written testimony may be emailed to board at hbws.org, or it can be faxed to 808-748-5079. A testimony was due by 12 noon today. However, you can still uh, attempt to uh, submit it as a late testimony. Uh, mail, uh, we were accepting mail testimony as well uh, via uh, U.S. mail uh, to Board of Water Supply at 630 South Bear Canyon Street, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96843. Uh, we are also accepting online testimony at Board of Water Supply, all spelled out, dot com slash testimony. Uh, we are accepting today telephone testimony. Um, you can call 
808-748-6040. Callers will be placed in a queue and brought up to testify one at a time. Unfortunately, at this time, we're still not accepting um, in-person testimony due to the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, um, materials for this meeting are available um, at www.boardofwatersupply.com, all spelled down, slash board meetings, all spelled down. Again, that's www.boardofwatersupply.com, slash board meetings, all spelled out. Uh, today, the meeting will be viewable via live streaming on the BWS website. And that website is at www.boardofwatersupply.com slash live. Uh, video will appear uh, on the screen. You may have to click the arrow on video to start it. Um, you may have to unmute audio as muted audio tends to be the default setting. All right, we have two items today on our agenda requiring board action. Item number one requiring board action is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on April 26. Um, uh, I think this should be March. Um, because we're approving the regular minutes of the regular meeting held on and let me just uh, get the date here for the record real quick. Yes. Uh, yeah, you're correct. That should be March 29, uh, 2021. So we're approving the minutes of our regular meeting held on, I'm sorry, was it March? Yeah, March 29, 2021. Um, I'd like to entertain a motion at this time. Um, this is Na'alahu, Anthony, uh, so moved. Yeah, Max, uh, second. Thank you, Member Anthony, for making the motion, and Member Sword for uh, seconding the motion. Uh, are there any questions, discussion, uh, any corrections to the minutes? Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, um, do we have anyone by um, by telephone? Uh, no one by telephone. Thank you. Let the record reflect. No one's here by telephone. Um, Members, any, any discussion before I call for the question? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of um, approving the minutes of the regular meeting held on March 29, 2021, um, say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed, please say nay. All right, let the record reflect that we have unanimous um, eyes and um, uh, the, the motion does carry and the minutes uh, are approved. Uh, all right, um, item number two. On the regular um, agenda today requiring board action is um the uh, uh chair uh chair hold on i'm sorry uh we're picking up some uh uh some noise uh folks on the telephone uh can you mute yourself jeff or jessica i i'm just hoping that our um neighborhood roosters don't start um <laughs> going on. Thank you. Back to so you, far, Chair. so good. <laughs> All right. So, item number two calls for the authorization of a public hearing to consider the proposed fiscal year uh, 2021 2022 operating and capital improvement program budget. Um, I believe this is um, a public hearing. Um, let's see here. Uh, do I have a motion to accept uh, this authorization to hold a public hearing uh, to consider the proposed fiscal year 2021-2022 operating and CIP budget? This is Ray. I, I move to uh, 
accept um, a public hearing. Uh, this is Max, I second. Okay. Um, this motion has been moved by member Soon and seconded by member Sword. Um, and just for clarification, um, is this authorization um, to conduct a public hearing um, for our May 10 budget workshop? Is that what it is? Uh, it's at May 24th, it says. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, uh, Chair, this is the uh, to conduct the public hearing just prior to the regular meeting of the board on May 24th. I see. Uh, the, I see. the budget workshop on, on May 10th will be uh, noticed separately as an information okay. workshop. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, I'll now move to discussion. Um, is there any discussion on this matter? This is Max, I have one quick question. Um, Ernie, uh, I know you, the materials are available online, but do you have a, uh, uh, printed copies available if somebody does want them? Uh, yeah, they can request a printed copy by uh, contacting us uh, directly of the draft budget. Okay, well, you, well, you just you just don't have a stack of them lying around. Basically, is what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> no, we. Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know how thick the, uh, how thick it is. But, uh, I, I'm just about, curious, you know, just in just in case somebody doesn't have a print at home or something like that, you know. Yeah, if uh, somebody wanted to print a copy, we can make one available. Uh, okay. Uh, for the board members, uh, board members, I think uh, we have delivered a hard copy to you also and a digital copy uh, for yeah. the board members' well, review. Well, maybe, may, uh, yeah, maybe uh, if you want to add something on the materials available for inspection, something where, uh, you know, if they call ahead to, uh, to get a printed copy, something like that, you know, that on there. I, I'm not saying anybody would, but just in case somebody doesn't have a uh, a printer or something. Uh, okay, we can uh, make a note of that on the uh, a notice uh, that if they yeah, wanted to yeah, expect yeah. a written just, just, uh, hard just, copy. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, just just so that they know that there is that uh, that that hard copy available, but at least give your staff an opportunity to print it up and not just you know print a whole bunch stack of them and nobody shows up. But in case they do yeah. want a hard copy to uh, well, to uh, let, we'll let the staff know ahead of uh, time. We'll put it in the notice to ask people to call ahead of time, and we can yeah, make arrangements. Yeah. But you're, you raise a good point. We don't want to print uh, like fifty uh, hard copies and and uh, and uh, destroy some trees doing that. Uh, yeah, you get you get you get the guys that want trees standing at uh, protesting at your door. You know. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah thanks. We want to save the trees. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and um, let's see. I see Ms. Nakabayashi's name on here. Is there a presentation that goes with, with this item? Uh, if you want, uh, she's available to answer any questions uh, regarding the uh, the budget workshop and the, actually the public hearing uh, before the next board meeting on the budget. Uh, Ray, Raylan Nakabayashi, head of our executive support office, and they're responsible to prepare the, the draft operating and CIP budgets. Go ahead, Ray. Good afternoon, Chair and members. So um, I can share with you folks the draft um, notice of public hearing, which is um, attached to today's agenda. Uh, but this is what will be published in the newspaper uh, prior to the board meet or the public hearing on the 24th. Um, just giving notice that the meeting is being held at two o'clock to discuss the fiscal year 22 operating and CIP budgets. It does um, say pursuant to the 19 supplementary proclamation, um, they will be held um, with in compliance. So testimony can be submitted either via written testimony, via mail or email, online testimony and telephone testimony. We will not be taking in-person testimony at the boardroom. The materials will be on the website, but um, thank you, uh, board member Sword. We will make sure that um, we can add something about if they will just contact my assistant, uh, Luella, um, we can get them a hard copy. They can pick one up. The meeting will be um, live streamed, same as our regular board meetings, and the link is there. 
And we do request if people want to register for testimony, um, if they could register for testimony by 1 p.m. on Friday, we can um, keep the meeting more orderly for the testimony portion. And testimony will be limited to two minutes, same as regular board meetings. Uh, so thank you, Chair. Uh, as uh, uh, Board Member Max uh, Swart uh, noted, that we'll add a section in that notice to uh, give the uh, public the opportunity to obtain a hard copy of the draft budget if they so request. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for that. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. Um, all those in favor of authorizing a, and um, before I do that, actually, uh, Mr. Nordstrom, are, are there any testifiers? Uh, no testifiers, Chair. So, um, Madam Secretary, have we received any um, written or other uh, testimony? No written testimony, Chair. Okay, thank you. Let the record reflect as such. Um, call for the question. All those in favor of authorizing a public hearing to consider the proposed fiscal year 2021-2022 operating and capital improvement program budget, please say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed? Um, um, please say nay. There you go. Sorry, any, any, was, did anyone say nay? Okay, hearing none, let the record reflect that we've got a unanimous consent on this authorization for a public hearing uh, to consider our fiscal year operating and CIP budgets. Uh, We'll now move on um, to the items for information. Uh, first up is the regulated dams under Board of Water Supply Control and Management. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Michael Matsuo. So if you go on to the... Uh, Good afternoon, Chair and members. I'm Mike Matsuo, Land Administrator. Um, in light of the recent potential failure of a regulated dam on Maui and the finding of owners of regulated dams on Oahu and Hawaii Island, I'm here today to provide you information on three state regulated dams, Nuanu Open Reservoir Number 4, Mana'olu 530 Open Reservoir, and Nuanu Open Reservoir Number 1, all of which are under Board of Water Supply, Jurisdiction, Control, and Management. Uh, a chair, before uh, Mike uh, continues, I'd just like to note that the uh, board member, uh, Jade Butai, has joined the meeting. Thank you. Let the record reflect. Okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Ready? Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, we have three state regulated dams under our control, the Nuanu Open Reservoir Number 4, the Mauna Olu 530 Open Reservoir, and Nuanu Open Reservoir Number 1. Nuanu Reservoir 4, as you know, is located off the Pali Highway, about four and a half miles from downtown Honolulu. It was originally constructed in 1910 and then reconstructed in 1934, and was to provide drinking water to Honolulu. However, after 1919, it was no longer being used as such, and it was uh, first for flood control and then as a fishery, but the fishery was discontinued in the 2000s. So it's currently only a flood control structure. This is an um, overhead view of the reservoir itself and the dam. Um, there's some information, by, uh, statistical information on the upper 
left corner. Uh, the dam length is a little over 2,000 feet. It's about 65 feet high. Uh, we do have a spillway on the um, far end, on the lower right corner. Uh, it's a paved spillway and then followed by a grassy spillway that empties into the stream. This is a cross section of the dam. As you can see here, the intake tower I think everybody knows about is the one everybody likes to jump off of and the suspension bridge that joins it to the crest of the dam. The intake tower does have three what we call sluice gates, which is how we would drain the reservoir at any given time. All the water that we drain would go through the intake tower down into a 24 inch drain line, which empties out at the toe of the dam. Mauna Olu 530 Open Reservoir is located in Makaha and was constructed in 1966. The purpose is to provide non-potable irrigation water to two golf courses which are located nearby. Unfortunately, the Makaha Resort Golf Course no longer is taking any water and we're only feeding the Makaha Valley Country Club or East, East Golf Course. And it is fed by a, um, a non-potable water source up in the back of Makaha Valley, Makaha Valley called Glover Tunnel. Again, this is an aerial view of the reservoir itself. This is a little different reservoir in that dam in that um, we, we originally thought it was actually a hole in the ground, but we actually found out that the front of the reservoir is actually created by a dam itself. Um, and it's not an in-stream dam where the dam is sitting on top of a stream. And again, uh, there's some statistical information on the bottom. It's about 800 feet long, about 27 feet high. And this is a cross section. Sorry, it's a little light, but um, basically water just comes in from the tunnel and then we use it to feed the golf courses. The dam itself is approximately 14 feet high and we keep the water level at about an elevation of 540 feet, which is about 10 feet of water. No, no open reservoir number one, again, everyone knows located off Holly Highway, uh, about two and a half miles from downtown Honolulu constructed in 1889, and originally was supposed to be provide drinking water and hydroelectric power to downtown Honolulu. Now it's being used as a debris and stormwater retention, detention basin. As you can see, there, there's homes pretty close to where the reservoir is. This is an aerial view. Again, some statistical information. It's about almost 600 feet long, about 34 feet high. Uh, we do have a spillway, which is a dirt spillway on the upper left side of the dam that empties into a drainage way and then goes down to the country club uh, subdivision. And it's located right next to our uh, Nuwano 405 reservoir. If you look at the kind of the bottom portion of the picture on the right side, you can see that round tank there with the solar panels on top of it. That's our uh, 405 reservoir. And again, here's a cross section. Again, a little light, sorry about that. Um, the dam is about 10 feet wide at the top and um, the, the bottom does toes is a lot lower than the actual elevation of the dam itself. Dam safety, reg safety regulations by the state. The State Department of Land and Natural Resources administers the dam and reservoir safety program in accordance with chapter 179D of the Hawaii Revised Statutes and Title 13, Chapter 190.1 .1 of the Hawaii Administrative Rules. Nuwano 4 Dam is classified as high hazard and has been inspected several times since, 19, uh, since 2004, the latest being uh, February of 2021. Further inspections, uh, we need to remove trees and vegetation, which was overgrown over the the length and width of the dam, as you can see on the top picture, there's a lot of big pine trees and a lot of overgrown vegetation. Uh, we also were required to repair the sluice gates and trash racks. On the bottom picture, you can see the trash rack, which is kind of hanging off there. The trash rack is to stop large debris from entering the sluice gates and um, blocking the 24 inch drain line. And also we, they wanted us to reestablish water level markings on the tower. On that picture on the bottom, you can actually see the painted uh, water level markings that have already been put in. Other things we need to do was to unblock the lower sluice gate. Uh, the picture on the right is a schematic. Uh, the gray portion at the bottom of the tower is silt, basically about 
17, 17 feet of silt, which is blocking the lower sluice gate. And so they wanted us to clear that out and make sure the gate was operational. The road on the crest has a lot of potholes. And there's also on one side of the dam, a temporary access road that we put in to remove a lot of the pine trees uh, a few years ago. And they want us to take that road out and reestablish the slope of the dam. So what we've done so far is we removed a lot of trees, as you might know from the dam, um, on the crest, on the embankments. So it's a pretty clear, nice grassy area now. And we do have a landscape contractor go in on a monthly basis to make sure we maintain all the vegetation and it doesn't get overgrown again. We have several improvements under construction. We dredged the silt from around the intake tar and the picture that there is, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little dredging machine near the intake tar, which was used to dredge out all the silt around the, the lower gate. Um, we're also um, repairing the sluice gates, making sure they operate pr properly. Uh, the trash racks need to be fixed and replaced. The bridge to the tower had some structural damage, which we, were, which we have fixed. Uh, we're extending that 24 inch drain line, so it goes a little farther from the toe, and installing weirs to monitor seepage from along the toe of the dam. Nuanu 4, in fact, all, all three dams are what we consider earthen dams in that they are made of soil. And as an earthen dam, you do have water movement through the dam itself. And so that water will come out at the toe is what we call seepage. Um, and again, we need to repave the dam access road. Uh, construction of these improvements are, are ongoing and are estimated to be completed by the first quarter of next year. Monolu 530, again, this is another high hazard dam um, and the state inspected it several times starting in 2014 and the latest was back in February of 2020. Like the Nuan 4, we needed to remove the vegetation on the embankment along the crest, uh, do a lot of um, studies in terms of hydrology and hydraulics, um, determine whether or not the spillway was, uh, it was adequately sized and also to perform dam safe stability analysis. We also were required to damage the torn reservoir liner. Uh, that's the top picture there. Uh, what if I could correct that to repair the damaged liner. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> repair and actually what, actually what we do is we, we, uh, we actually um, replace the entire liner. What had happened was the um, fire department had used the reservoir as a dip tank for fires in the area. And uh, uh, um, the, the rotors caused the dam, the liner to get all ripped up and pulled up. So um, that's why you see those big ragged holes there. Uh, also, they, the state recommended that we do an up, we provide upstream control for the reservoir to drain it right now. As a reservoir, um, we use the, um, the water to serve the customers as a way to control water levels in the reservoir itself. Um, they also asked us to repaint water uh, level markings on the liner and then also repair the inlet channel concrete walls. You can see on the bottom picture, the, the wing walls are kind of coming apart. So the improvements we've done again, we've removed all the vegetation. That picture on the right is the, actually the control valve that's used to drain water out of the reservoir itself. It was kind of buried in a lot of vegetation originally, and so we had them clear it. We've also replaced the liner, as you can see on the bottom photo. We've also um, installed a new spillway. It's with a 36 inch drain line, which acts as a spillway, and we repaired the inlet channel with concrete walls and the bottom picture shows uh, staff gauges that were painted on top of the line. And those are the white lines that are there. Uh, we are currently designing a remote water level gauge so that we're able to read it uh, remotely from both uh, laptops, iPads, or the office computers. That design is ongoing. New one one dam inspections, again, classified as high hazard and they've uh, inspected it several times starting in 2015. This one was badly overgrown. There was no outlet pipe to empty the reservoir itself and there was no level gauge out at the site. Actually, if you look at the, the pictures, it kind of looks like four except it was a little more overgrown. If you look at the bottom picture, that's a banyan tree that was growing in the middle of the dam. It was 17 feet by 30 feet wide 
and it was a major issue that they wanted us to take care of. And which we did. We had a contractor go in, he chipped out the, that big banyan tree, so it's no longer there. We cleared up the drainage way at the bottom, which is the picture on the right. And again, we have someone going on a monthly basis to, to maintain all the vegetation. We've also installed eight siphons. The picture on the left is uh, the siphons that are operating. We have eight siphons, which have a capacity of 1,000 GPM, approximately. We have um, a water level remote a water level remote gauge, which is that middle picture. It's a satellite gauge that the uh, University of Hawaii put in. And we also have a staff gauge, which is that red and white pole, which we can use to monitor uh, visually. And of course, we have um, security cameras installed as well. We have improvements currently under design. We're going to replace the earthen spillway with a concrete line spillway. We're going to put a pipe through the middle of the dam so that we can actually control uh, drain the reservoir as needed instead of using the siphons. We're putting in monitor wells, weirs, and sub drains so that we can monitor seepage. And we're also going to be improving the embankments for better stability. The design is scheduled to be completed uh, in late 2021 or early next year with construction to follow in fall of next year. Okay, emergency action plans. We were required to submit prepare and submit emergency action plans for all the dams, which we have done for the past several years. We last updated them in 2020. Uh, they have been sent to the state as well as other um, stakeholders, such as the city, Department of Environmental Management, uh, Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, HPD, and so forth. Each EAP identifies action triggers in response to various situations, which are listed there. Um, it's important to note the situation themselves is not the major determining factor uh, regarding failure. It's what happens because of these things. So we've identified three event levels, levels one through three. Uh, level one, of course, is an unusual event which is slowly developing or not developing at all, and it's not an emergency. Level two is an emergency where there is a potential for dam failure, and of course, level three is pretty much dam failure is imminent or is in progress. And there are certain triggers that we look for for these different events. Uh, level one, new conditions are detected but not worsening. So say you have a crack that we, we determine that's there, but nothing's happening with it, it's not getting larger, uh, water's not leaking out through it and so forth. Level two, there, the dam conditions are starting to deteriorate to the extent ferry mayor care. Uh, we have a crack or we see seepage, which is getting worse or we see soil coming out of the water, which means that the dam structure itself is starting to deteriorate. And of course, level three, the conditions are so bad already that the failure is about to happen, or it's getting worse. So here are um, examples of event triggers. Uh, for level one, again, like I said, you have to see a crack in the embankment, but there's nothing going on with it. It's just a crack, no seepage. There is uh, visible evidence of uh, the slope of the embankment is slipping, and the water level is two feet below the spillway and rising. That's the spillway thing. Um, sometimes we just have water coming in and it's just going up. So we just continue to monitoring it. That doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong. Level two, uh, you're seeing new cracks forming and you're seeing seepage coming through. Um, you're seeing some sudden or rapid sliding of the slope of the embankment and the water level is dropping without any apparent cause itself. Uh, that, that's a sign that something's going on where the water is coming out of the dam somehow, and it's probably seeping through the thing and coming out the front, which is a uh, bad condition itself. In that, we're seeing the spillway flowing, but the water levels continue to rise, indicating that the spillway cannot keep up with the inflow coming into the reservoir itself, and there's a extreme danger of the reservoir overtopping, which is something you don't want to do because once you overtop the reservoir, the, and because it's all made of soil, the soil deteriorates very quickly. And especially for new one on one, the, the homes are really close by. So you want to make sure we catch that. Level three, again, you see some rapid stuff going on, the presence of a whirlpool indicating is 
draining rapidly, which is not a good sign, and the dam is overtopping, and you're seeing uh, erosion being caused on the spillway itself. We have come up with evacuation plans for all three dams, as you can see here. They're based on flood inundation studies and were created in consultation with both the city and the state. So this is the evac plan for New 104. It is from the reservoir all the way to the H1, and it covers both sides of the Pali Highway through portions of Nuwanu, Pao'oa, and Liliha. The evacuation plan was such that it doesn't only cover those areas that could be inundated, but they also included a 200-foot buffer on either side. This is the evacuation plan for Mauna'olu. Not too many homes in Mauna'olu right near the home, well, right near the reservoir, there's, there's a few homes. But Mauna'olu State Subdivision is not real well built out yet. And so water would just flow through the golf course and head towards the beach. However, closer to Farrington Highway, there are residential areas uh, near Makaha Beach that could be impacted. Evacuation plan for New Wano 1. Uh, again, from the reservoir to Honolulu Harbor, uh, on the Eva side of Pali Highway through portions of Liliha and Ivele. Um, the uh, evacuation plan for New One of Four is similar. We just didn't include the, the lower portions of Ivile because we thought that possibly H1 would stop the flow. But it is possible that even under uh, evacuation plan for New One of Four, we would actually look at evacuating down to um, Honolulu Harbor itself. So what do we do? Well, we keep the water level at less than half full at New 104. The picture on the right is the intake tower. And if you can see the markings, it's at about 30 feet or 29 feet. Um, and just to let you know that even when we had those 40 days and nights of rain back in 2006, uh, the water did not hit the spillway. Uh, New 101, we keep the water as low as possible. In fact, we try to keep it empty at all times. Uh, the picture on the left there actually shows water in the reservoir itself. Uh, that was after a rainstorm. We also, during emergencies, provide daily water level readings to Haima, also the state, and then the city, and we coordinate and communicate with the mayor's office. Um, in, in, in response to the, um, the event with Nuwan One back in 2018, we've also started outreach to the neighborhood boards to provide them links to the evacuation plans and provide them dam information. So that um, graphic on the side there is what we provide to the neighborhood, what we provided to the neighborhood board. We also monitor water levels online using cameras and water level gauges. The picture on the right is a screenshot from the satellite water level gauges that we have at New One One and Four, which were installed by UH. The picture on the bottom shows pumps that we can station out there. Um, the pumps we have of capacities of 1,200 GPM to 3,300 GPM. And of course, at New 101, we have the eight siphons, which we can activate once water hits a certain level. Um, we usually look for like about four feet of water before we can start draining. And within 24 hours, assuming there's no inflow into the reservoir itself, we can pretty much knock the level down to zero. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Well, Members, any you. questions? Yeah, I, I, I do have questions. Uh, Mike, why do we maintain these three reservoirs? It, I don't see that it addresses the core of our mission. Um, why? why why don't we turn these over to Roger and DFM? Well, board members, soon what happened was these reservoirs were used at one time for potable water distribution um, right. over the years. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I unfortunately, can we, yes. Unfortunately, because they were used as potable water reservoirs, they were turned over to us and put under our control by the state. And I think after we stopped using them as power reservoirs, we didn't do any actions to transfer them over to the more appropriate government agencies. And so basically, we got stuck with it. Uh, we actually, uh, just to correct that, we uh, board members soon have uh, attempted uh, multiple times to approach the state about 
giving back the uh, property, including the reservoirs, back to the state of Hawaii. Uh, and they uh, politely declined. Okay, in the case of the Macau one, though, I mean, that one is, is just feeding a, a private enterprise. I, I don't, I, I definitely don't understand that one. Um, yeah, I, uh, that one, I, uh, when the Board of Water Supply acquired the property, I think in the 80s, Makaha Valley, including the property where this reservoir was, uh, they, we, uh, we actually purchased that whole er uh, area. And I think it, it does kind of also um, align with our mission for conservation of resources. It is because it's only using uh, the golf courses are there and need irrigation water. It's important that we don't give them potable water and instead give them non-potable waters, which is which is what comes out of new uh, Glover Tunnel. Yeah, Glover Tunnel what... was a source that was owned by the developer uh, when we purchased and we acquired Glover Tunnel, which is a non-potable source. Uh, so this uh, this reservoir actually provides a feed, gets fed by Glover Tunnel, and then from Glover Tunnel, it uh, supplies irrigation water to one of the golf courses there. In so does what we charge them for this non-potable water cover our costs? Yeah, it, it like Mike said, it, it uh, uh, allows us to not have the golf course use, you know, potable water for irrigation. They can use non-potable water instead of potable water. But Ernie, you actually avoided my question. Um, are, they, are they covering our costs? Uh, or are I, we subsidizing this private enterprise? Uh, that's a good question. I need to look at our cost of service analysis to see if we're recovering our full costs. Uh, and I'm not sure what the rates we're charging them. Uh, it's our non-potable rates. Uh, the other things that happen with our non-potable rates is uh, to encourage use uh, and uh, saving our potable resources. Uh, we we actually probably uh, charge a little lower than full cost of recovery, but alternatively, people would not would use puddle water instead. So, so Ray, we can get back to you. I, we'd have to go look at our cost of service analysis for the last rate study to see what the cost of service to provide this water to the golf course and if we're recovering our full cost or if we're uh, having it subsidized by the potable water customers. Uh, so I, I would appreciate that. I, I, I kind of would appreciate really, I guess, understanding our costs on maintaining these other two uh, facilities as well. It, it clearly looks like you guys have done a great job in the last few years at bringing the, the reservoirs up to uh, standard or at least up to DLNR standard. It, it might be the appropriate time to try again to transfer the, the facilities. Um, I, and unless you believe that we're gonna need them in the future and you wanna- uh, You know, we, uh, I, for, for, I've been here, you know, about nine, a little over nine years now and uh, have made multiple attempts approaching DLNR to take the reservoirs back uh, because I kind of viewed uh, these reservoirs as a liability, which they are, because we have to we have to comply with the state dam safety regulations. Uh, but the other thing that we done some uh, planning studies on was uh, utilizing uh, new one of four and new one of number one as a way to generate hydropower again, and also use the water it is captured behind the reservoirs for aquifer recharge. Uh, so trying to look at the opportunities from these 100 year plus facilities uh, for possibly capturing stormwater and using it for recharging underground aquifers. Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of the idea that with climate change, we might have intense short duration storm, rainstorm events, but rather than having the water flow into the ocean, we can maybe uh, detain it and then uh, try to use it for recharge. So we have an ongoing uh, study right now uh, looking into that. Okay. Chair. Thank you. Chair. Chair. Yes, uh, Member Butai. Uh, do we get any federal or state funds for the dam safety? Uh, 
Unfortunately, no. The, we're, we don't have access to uh, state funds uh, for, for this project, uh, for the work that we have to do on the dams. Uh, access to federal funds, I'm not sure uh, if uh, Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would help to fund improvements there. I know they are, uh, there are federal, uh, potentially federal funds available for like the Alawai watershed uh, projects, uh, but uh, that's a good question. We, we're not sure if there are funds available for new Wanu uh, dams in Amana Olu and Makaha. All the all the dams are classified as high hazard, and, and they seem to no longer, you know, serve the purpose that they were built for. But uh, would it make sense to remove any of them? Uh, you know, that's one of the options is to decommission the dam, and basically let the stream flow, uh, re, re, go back to what it was before. Uh, but the challenges at our new Wano reservoirs are that the areas below the dam, like Mike showed in the evacuation areas, uh, when the dams are built, maybe uh, almost a hundred, uh, new one one, I think it's a little over a hundred years ago, and uh, four was rebuilt in the thirties. Uh, the areas have become heavily urbanized. Uh, so it looks like uh, people have built very close to the streams. So if we, we'd have to look very carefully if we remove the dams, which now serve as kind of like a detention basin for storm events to help moderate the, uh, the flow in the stream from the storm event. And Mike, you can jump in anytime to correct me that you would lose that kind of the storm, storm uh, flood management aspects of the dam, even though maybe they weren't originally uh, intended that way. So, so uh, board member Butai, we can look uh, closer. I think we have studied decommissioning. Uh, have we studied the decommissioning? No, we actually haven't. But the concern is about downstream liability if we decommission. So with these dams, we face the challenge of we they're high risk uh, as designated by state regulations. And we have to invest in, in uh, um, bringing them up to uh, the required standards to meet those regulations. Uh, but then if we were to uh, decommission the dams and take them out of service, which would mean kind of opening up the dam and letting the stream flow back again, then the, the issues will have to be looked very closely at, uh, are we gonna create downstream flooding of, of properties uh, because the dam is no longer there. Uh, so, so Any new one reservoir is a more problematic one because it's it's a lot larger than the other new one reservoirs themselves. New one one might be a difficult sell to convince the residents of decommissioning is in our best interest because, as you can see, the homes are really close to new one reservoir number one, and it does act as a retention basin right now for any storms. So if we were to take it out, without providing any way of mitigating that, I think the downstream residents at the country club subdivision would probably get um, flooded every time there's a huge rainstorm that comes through. Yeah, yeah Ernie, this is this is Max. Uh, I, I echo uh, Ray's uh, sentiment in terms of, uh, you know, since we're not using it to um, retain water for uh, usage, usage. Uh, and, and you said you've been, you've been, you know, you guys are planning or something about studying it. Let me put you on the hot seat. Uh, how long have you been studying that? Uh, we've actually conducted uh, initial study with uh, uh, some support from uh, the Ulupono, initi uh, Ulupono Initiative, uh, and uh, and uh, at the point, you know, we did approach One Electric about basically selling them hydropower, uh, power electricity generated through the flow of water from the higher dam to the lower dam. That kind of fell through, so we looked at it again to see. Uh, do a more detailed study on uh, can we use it for aquifer recharge to capture storm water and then recharge the underground aquifer. So that study is still undergoing. Uh, it has uh, probably been about three or four years we've had these studies uh, underway right now. Ernie, uh, I have a 
I have a follow-up question to that as well. In looking at recharge, are you looking at injection wells or are you just looking at recharge directly from the reservoir itself? Uh, there's probably some recharge from the reservoir itself, but uh, again, you know, it's heavily silted. So we were looking at actually a, a Kapoa was injection, but it would have to be treated before we inject it in the ground uh, into the uh, underground aquifers there. I think the injection wells are being looked at as being uh, we're getting water from the 104, setting it to the 101, and putting the injection wells at the 101, where it would be used to recharge the aquifer that feeds the um, Kalihi sources. Yeah, you yeah. know, and then also the uh, the drop in elevation between number four and number one, we could generate some of the power that would help offset the power cost for treatment and injection. Right, for inline. But that's why I was asking because treatment can be expensive. And so is it, are the treatment and, and injection aspects part of what you're looking at in the studies that are going on right now? I, I believe so. And we and haven't reached a firm conclusion yet on that, uh, but, uh, but we're trying to look at the, uh, what are some of the re, uh, climate change resiliency actions we can take to adapt to uh, changing conditions. And when do you expect that those will be POW, the studies? Uh, I have to get back to you. I have to talk to our, our, our division that's responsible for doing the study, um, the completion of the study. We'd be glad to brief the board on the outcomes of that. Uh, but based on the, today's uh, discussion with the board members, we, we can uh, write a letter uh, requesting the transfer of these two, uh, these two reservoirs, or these reservoirs back to the state of Hawaii. If the board would like us to do that, the state yeah, has actually, yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's, it, yeah uh, sorry, this is Max. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you should explore every option because, as Ray said, you know, that's a liability. And it, I think, and, and uh, as uh, Jay said, you know, it, it's listed as a uh, high risk, and uh, we just got rid of a high risk uh, problem over at the stairs. So, uh, you know, let's. Uh, Look at uh, doing what we're supposed to do and get rid of uh, other high risk uh, uh, liabilities to the the border water supply. So, uh, yeah. yeah, if if you could, I, I I don't know about the rest of them, but yeah, I would I would welcome uh, you know a letter to the state or at least updating us on the various uh, scenarios that you're looking at, uh, either uh, the injection or uh, turning it over to another uh, uh, entity. That that would be something be nice to uh, you know be good to know. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll reach out to the state again. Ernie, I, 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 I think before you reach out to the state, uh, a nice little white paper to us that says, that answers the question is, why do we own these anymore? Not, not why did we, but why do we own them anymore? What is its value to our ratepayers? And why are our ratepayers paying for this and not all of the islands um, or states taxpayers? Um, and what's it, what, why is it of value to us going forward? And if, if you don't find answers that make you feel good about proposing to us that we hang on to them, then let's proceed aggressively with either returning them to the state or transferring them to the appropriate county agency. And, and Ray, if I may just add on to that, I agree. It would be super helpful for me before we send the letter to get more information on exactly where we are. For example, if we could find out when we're going to know when the studies are going to be POW, so we'll have a sense about the injection. Because if not, I'd also like to look at decommissioning and what that would cost. Because if no one else wants it and we don't necessarily need it and we can explore the conservation options for sure, um, then we can look at either decommissioning or some sort of agreement, for example, with the golf course that they take on liability and maintenance costs. And I fully mm -hmm. understand the the policy implications of having non-potable water for non-potable uses, but I'm just trying to understand, you know, kind of what the costs and benefits are. For for example, um how much did it cost to reline the reservoir in Mauna Olu? Does anybody know? Mike, do you know? Uh, Mike, do you know? I'm sorry, I don't know. We'll have to get back to you. I'm we I'm just curious because that can be that can be really expensive. And I, I totally get it. Wildfires, we want to do our part, contribute, you know, for the firefighting effort, but but I just wanna see how this is penciling out. Uh yeah, the uh, some I think some of the discussion probably we have to also look at the 
uh, the legal liabilities of uh, any of the decisions uh, on the options. Uh, so okay. we'll, uh, we'll prepare something. I, I can't say it's gonna be available next month, but I'll need a little bit of time to get it together to cover all sure. these assets. I'd be glad to do that. Great, that'd be more than fair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, good questions for it. Yeah, um, thank you everybody. Thank you, um, Mr. Matsu for the presentation, Manager Lau as well, uh, board members, excellent um, questions. Um, I knew a lot of this would come up. I knew that we had to put this on the agenda, both for um, the short-term liability emergency plan, which is what initially caught my attention, but also on a long-term strategic basis, basis, you know, how we are going to approach uh, these assets that we we have. So um, definitely hear you, Manager Lau, it's gonna take some time. Um, this is uh, <laughs> going to be quite a project. I'm not sure, um, we'll, we'll, we can definitely keep it on the agenda uh, for now. I'm not sure if at some point it would be appropriate to establish a permitted in interaction group or maybe make it part of our next um, strategic planning uh, agenda or something like that. But we definitely wanna uh, loud and clear, we want to um, monitor uh, the status of these assets. And, and Chair, if yeah. I may, um, Ernie, if it's more appropriate for us to have our next discussion in executive session, I'd also welcome that. I'm just trying to make sure that we understand kind of the full gamut of what we're dealing with here. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, let us uh, let us take a hard look at this and uh, prepare something uh, to brief the board, either in open session or executive session, uh, after a consultation with our corporation council deputy. Thank you. If there's no, yeah, if there's no further discussion, I do want to um, thank again, uh, Mr. Matsuo, Manager Lau and the department for um, at least keeping it in, in, um, in compliance uh, because the consequence of either a breach or a failure or, or even a fine is really just um, unthinkable. Uh, yes, thank you. That is uh, correct. Uh, as long as we uh, retain ownership, we are responsible to comply with the Damn safety regulations. All right, if nothing else, we're gonna move on to the next item. All right, um, next item, item number two for information is the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Raylin Nakabayashi. Good afternoon, Chair members. Um, so I'm here today to present some lessons learned from our COVID-19 pandemic um, as a follow-up to the good questions from board member Anthony last month. So let me just open up my PowerPoint. Okay. So last month, Ernie sent me an article from the Harvard Business Review. And for organizations and individuals, this pandemic has represented a prolonged uh, time of trial. It's uh, a period, I guess, cultural anthropologists would call a liminal experience, which is like a rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. Um, the term, or it's a concept that can also be applied to what we're going through um, right now, significant transitions in our organizational lives. Um, We've also, and we've been so focused on implementing changes immediately and quickly that until last month, I hadn't really spent much time reflecting on what we have learned or where we're going in all of this. So I think this quote um, from the article Ernie sent me really describes um, where we're at right now. So we've learned that disruption and ambiguity can yield valuable lessons and we're capable of far greater adaptability than we may have previously imagined. Um, through this past year, we've remained focused on our mission and goals while trying to keep our employees and customers safe, evaluating all of our business processes and metrics and looking for additional ways to optimize. We, in the beginning of the pandemic, we did many things. So one of the first things that we did was review and update our continuity of operations plan or our COOP. Um, we identified um, like key positions and absentee tolerance levels for how we could keep going, um, at what threshold we, we weren't gonna be able to operate anymore. We developed contingency plans for when we hit those thresholds and we implemented safety protocols also for these key functions and personnel to ensure that we could keep them safe since they're a critical part of continuing to operate. 
And we've established contacts and contingency plans for all of the critical services and supplies to make sure that we could maintain them. We also learned a lot through this past year when it comes to keeping our employees safe. Um, sick employees must stay home. What we've learned that remote work is doable. We're reevaluating um, open concept floor plans and the workstation allocations here. And we have also learned that, you know, increased routine cleaning does enhance comfort for the staff in the workplace. One of the most interesting things when I did a look back on this past year and how everything has been going, um, I found it interesting that sick leave usage during the pandemic, so that's those bars in purple, um, on average actually is lower than it has been in prior years. Um, so we've learned, you know, masking, social distancing, keeping sick employees home, increased sanitation, all of these things um, have been working to keep our workforce more healthy. There's been a lot of lessons learned regarding remote work, which is something that wasn't widely practiced previous to the pandemic, but um, we've seen like, one of the successes is a reduction in both office space needs and parking requirements. Um, since the pandemic, a lot of people have been either teleworking, flexing their schedules, and using locations other than the Baratania campus as their home base. Um, this is read up parking, and um, if we can continue this, we can look at working with our existing office um, workspace rather than looking to expand. I think uh, about a year ago before the pandemic like really came down on us hard, we were actually looking, I was touring office space with Ernie and Ellen because we were looking to expand our footprint, we needed more space for more staff. We have a lot of initiatives. We're bringing on new engineers. We needed office space. This year, just one year after that, we're in a completely different mind frame now. Now we're looking at things like hoteling and hot desking as a way to maximize the footprint that we have rather than just going out and leasing more space. Um, we've also increased our productivity and efficiency um, through remote work when managed appropriately. Um, we've also um, seen success with communication. We find that um, sometimes communication with staff can be more organized and efficient, actually, when done remotely. And we've also seen um, increases in, I guess, trust and accountability between employee and supervisor. Um, the relationship of telework is, is different from your traditional office setting, so it's a lot of trust on both sides, employees and supervisors. Um, to make sure that this happens. Oh, I'm sorry, Ernie, also, did you want me to mention that we have all of our program administrators on the line? So if anyone has uh, questions. No, you don't have to mention oh, okay. If we need to bring them aboard, we can okay. ask them to join us. Okay. Um, moving on. So some of the challenges there have also been challenges. You know, not everything has been um, perfect through the last year, and we recognize that. So it is, we found that remote work is not a one-size-fits-all program. Um, it does work best for certain types of work done by specific types of people, both employees and supervisors. It's not something that we can just have the whole board do or even a whole division or a whole section. It's really specific to each person and the even supervisors themselves. We've also learned that um, maintaining the human element has been important and that's been a challenge. It can be hard to connect when staff are working remotely. You lose the casual hallway interactions and the coffee break talk. Um, we have found over this last year though, there are actually um, not very many, if at all, employees that telework 100% of the time. All of us um, telework mostly part-time so we still have the face-to-face -face with our coworkers. Um, we still have a little bit of like coming in, so we're not completely isolated at home. We've also, um, virtual meeting fatigue has been something that we're working. I'm sure everybody across the world is combating that right now. Um, it can, I mean, virtual meetings can be challenging for many reasons. You know, there's an unnatural lack of verbal cues. It's hard, you end up talking over each other sometimes because you can't see if someone's gonna start saying something. So it can be difficult. It can be more stressful to meet virtually. Um, we also, when I look back at my calendar this past year versus what it used to look like before, I used to get breaks in between meetings because I had to actually walk there. So my secretary never booked me back to back. 
But now that everything's virtual, I can we can go um, into meeting after meeting. Um, so we have more time to meet because we don't have to count travel time anymore. But all of those things we have to remember um, to you know schedule some breaks for ourselves. Um, take it just like one day at a time. <laughs> use the comments and um, raising hand buttons in the meetings to try to help them flow. It's all been different, but we're learning. Um, we've also learned a lot about our customers during this pandemic. Um, we provided as many like remote business options that we could and as quickly as we could. And we've found that they have been embracing them. They actually, um, customers have been moving in that direction. We, when we reopened our lobby, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, wayfinding and signage that would make things clear so people don't congregate, they don't get confused, they know exactly where they go, they know where they need to stand, especially now with social distancing, you don't want a whole bunch of people crowding the door. You want everyone to know where they need to go when they come in. And again, communication between us and the customers is key. So, as a follow-up to that last point about remote business options, so this is just a snapshot in time, March 2019, March 2020, and March 2021 on the number of payments we've been getting by payment category. So as you can see, almost all of the non-in-person options are on the rise. They've increased since 2019. More and more customers are using that option versus all of your in-person options like paying with a credit card in our lobby or paying cash in our lobby or paying at a satellite city hall those are all on the decline so one of the other important things we've done through this pandemic was to monitor our finances we did update our long-range financial plan um, to include additional stressors such as the pandemic um, this is a whole new territory for us because the pandemic really has been a prolonged emergency operations period. It's been a whole year and longer of us operating under this stress. Uh, we had to factor in, and this is something we've learned and we'll continue to go forth in the future, but we looked at disasters one at a time and how we would react. We've learned through this pandemic, we actually have to look at multiple things happening simultaneously and how do you react? It could be pandemic time plus a hurricane hits and we needed to prepare ourselves for all of those um, different scenarios. We've also established strict budgetary controls and practices. Um, the uncertainty in the pandemic's inherent. We don't know what our revenues are gonna be like, how this is gonna affect the economy long-term. Everyone has gotten in the mode of prioritizing your essential needs so that we can maintain operations even with less resources, because that's what we've been looking at through the coop. Like, how do we keep going if everything happens to us at once? And everyone has worked together to tighten up our budgets where possible. And again, we continue monitoring our revenues. We've increased our collection efforts while remaining cognizant of the economic challenges our customers are facing. So we've made a lot of investments in technology over the last year that we're going to, I guess, double down on and keep using like the Cisco WebEx systems that we're meeting on right now. We've expanded all of these to, or we've expanded these to all of our base yards. So this technology has moved out across the BWS. Our board meetings like this are live streamed to the public. Our board members are joining via WebEx. So the systems have been very useful for us. We've also increased, I guess, our remote worker and virtual meeting tools. So we've increased our the number of laptops we have, web cameras, headsets. Um, internally, our IT division developed a, a telework log to make um, keeping track of what you're doing either in the office or when you're out of the office a little bit easier. We've also experienced a lot of digital transformations. One of those would be the electronic and digital signatures. We've been working on, I guess, moving even more paper towards that electronic um, version, I guess, rather than its hard copy version. We're also looking at, uh, or we did, we're launching for this fiscal year, um, I'm sorry, not fiscal year, the current one, but fiscal year 22, a professional service consultant portal so that submissions can be made electronically rather than hard copy to our annual ad. 
We also are still working um, and even more rapidly on scanning in our electronic document retention. And we've also established the interactive voice response for our bill paying customers. So um, there have been a lot of benefits in this investment in technology. I and mean, one of the first things that we saw is that meeting and training attendance have actually increased. You know, like I mentioned earlier, the chat functions in WebEx allow meetings and trainings to be conducted with less operations. We've also um, found the WebEx training module to be incredibly good at mimicking the classroom. So for training that doesn't need to happen in person, you know, there's no skills testing or any kind of, um, like for example, CPR. We can't teach CPR on a WebEx, but for a lot of our other classes, we can. There's still, it mimics a lot of the um, features such as like polling the class, setting everybody into breakout sessions to do an assignment. So we're enjoying the WebEx training. We've also reevaluated and studied a lot of processes to make them more efficient. And we're not gonna go back to the old non-efficient way when the pandemic ends, we're continuing to move forward. Uh, remote work has forced us to modify, to I guess work with people who are working from home, but that has brought a lot of efficiencies. Um, and this increased use of technology has allowed staff to actually innovate and develop solutions for like new and rapidly changing problems. Um, we've been like this for a little over a year now. And when we think, when another thing that I noticed when I thought back on it is we've been design thinking. I don't know if everyone's familiar with that Stanford, um, it's a degree I guess you can get, but um, probably unintentionally, it's just the, what we've been doing. Change has been happening so quickly. Um, challenges are presented so quickly that we're, we've become essentially more nimble and more open to change. Where people would be resistant to change in the past, we find that there are more and more change leaders across the department. So as the uncharted territory and the lack of information and precedent for what we're facing now has freed us to question storm, which is just come up with a bunch of good questions on tackling the issues, try them out um, quickly. We don't judge, we just keep trying. No one has a, no one had a solution to COVID in the beginning and no one had a solution to how we adapt. So everything was valid. Come up with something, we will um, work it out. Whatever we can do to keep the employees safe, the customers safe, like we were moving forward. How can we make processes more efficient? We've, we're looking at them all. And so just in conclusion, we continue to learn, uh, we're not through this. Um, the provision of safe, dependable and affordable water can have no interruptions, but that doesn't mean we can't change our processes and adapt. And we have continued full operations and intend to um, by still focusing our efforts to ensure employee and customer safety, um, continually evaluating that coop. It's not a static document. Uh, we change it. We look at it, who are the key personnel, what are the key functions, how can we keep that fresh um, and on top of mind. And our financial position is something we're always watching. And the optimization of workflows and business processes, again, it's something that we continue to do. We're still working remotely. We still have staff um, out of the office. So what we can do to make the electronic processes better um, will only help. Any questions? Are, are there any questions, uh, board members? Um, Mr. Chair, if, if I might, this is um, not Allahu. Just, uh, just some words of thanks for the update. And it's really encouraging to see um, city and state offices using this as an opportunity to transform services for the betterment of not only the cost structure, but for everyone who has to interact with these different agencies. So mahalo nui. Very welcome. Thank you. Attorney, uh, this is Jade. Uh, you know, the telework is an ongoing challenge for us. And so we're following a hybrid uh, in letting our managers make the decision on who uh, should telework since they know their situation best and, you know, much more informed about uh, you know, there's about their, what their subordinates are doing. How are you dealing with the, you know, the equity 
you know, because I know certain employees, they not, you know, you, they cannot telework. And, you know, and there's a perception that they're not as engaged about uh, operations. Well, the, um, uh, not every job is suitable for remote work or telework. Uh, for example, like our UPW uh, uh, field operations staff, uh, their work can be done remotely. Uh, so what we, we've done is uh, I've left the each division program administrator take a look at their operations, just like I think what you've done, Jade, and uh, kind of make the call what what works, what doesn't work when it comes to uh, teleworking. Uh, so it's not a one size fits all approach that we've taken. For the employees that come to the to the workplace or the job site, so we work really hard to try to make sure that we've done as much as we possibly can to create a safe workplace for them uh, by providing you know things like masks, social distancing, arrangement of the offices, flexible work schedules, uh, those kinds of op uh, opportunities. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, there's there's not going to be complete equity where every employee has the option to telework uh, because it, from a business standpoint, it's not appropriate. I don't know if I answered your question there, uh, Jade. No, you did. Uh, you know, because you know, telework is a you know is a privilege, not a right. Uh, that's how we're and we're handling it on a yeah. case by case uh, basis. And the telework is between a, an employee and the supervisor. And you know, it can be revoked at any time. Uh, that us. is, yeah, that is correct. Uh, it, it isn't a right uh, because the, before the pandemic, everybody was coming to work and showing up in the office or in the base yard and going out in the field to do their jobs. But because of the pandemic, we've given more flexibility as government to allow for telework, uh, but we still have the same expectations from our staff to be productive, to provide a honest day's work uh, for our customers. So uh, we've also kind of created more accountability in terms of those that are remote working have to keep a telework log uh, and basically kind of keep track of what they're working on, uh, how much time they spent on different tasks, and that they're responsible to turn that into their supervisors. We still have the supervisors still maintain supervisor responsibility, even though the employee may not come in the office all the time. Uh, but it is, you know, like uh, like Ray pointed out, there are some challenges, um, not always uh, doable for uh, in circumstances. Maybe when you have a brand new employee that does is brand new to the job. It's some of the difficulty is how do you train a brand new employee on what the job is about remotely? Uh, that's not always easy. So uh, each telework, each person, uh, each request that comes in uh, to telework has to go through a, a approval process that ends up with with me as the manager. Uh, so it includes their supervisor, the program administrator. Uh, it goes through our, our human resources office and then it eventually comes to, to me for final approval. Yeah, I do the same. I, I make the final approval, but uh, like I said, I, you know, I defer to my managers to, you know, make the decision. Yeah. And in terms of the new employee, I mean, because sometimes a lot of our work relies on strong relationship and trust building, and especially if it's a new employee, I mean, you cannot just say, oh, go telework. And, you know, and, and also it misses the, you know, the culture part. How do you, you know, maintain, you know, the culture if everybody, especially the new employees don't, especially the new employees have the strong relationship and, you know, haven't built the trust. Right, that's uh, very true. So the human element of uh, working in an organization and how do you build uh, build a cohesive team. Uh, so going forward, you know, right now we're, uh, the city is operating under like a COVID version of telework, which is much more flexible to provide for social distancing and reducing the spread of the, the virus among the workforce. Uh, 
but going on, you know, when the permanent policy comes out, we'll have to uh, take a look at the requirements and uh, kind of reevaluate for the long term what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. I think uh, the points Ray, you know, Ray was making is that we've learned some valuable lessons that I would hate to lose and kind of go back to the way we did business pre pandemic. Because there are some real positives that we learned out of it that I think are beneficial to our organization. Right. Um, members, any further questions? Okay, hearing none. Um, thank you very much to board member Anthony for um, raising this uh, very interesting topic. I'm sure we're going to continue to have lessons learned. Uh, thank you to Ms. Nakabayashi for preparing the report and manager now for your support. Well, Moving on to the next item, item number three. This is the status update of groundwater levels at all index stations. Chair recognizes Mr. Barry Usagawa. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this is the status update for the groundwater levels. There are two aquifer index wells in low groundwater condition. Uh, for March, it's the same as last month, Punalu and Wailua, in caution. And they're in caution by about 0 .0, 0 0.05 feet, so in less than an inch. Um, so they're relatively high. The monthly production in March was 121, which is fairly low for March, um, below our five month moving average and below last year, too. Um, We've had a lot of rain in March, 208% of normal, and the five-month moving average is 130%. So, um, and then National Weather Service is still forecasting above normal rainfall through June. And I'll just scroll through quickly the, uh, just to show you the rainfall totals. Um, so yeah, so January and March are very high. So what I look at is this uh, five month moving average. Um, when this exceeds the red line, which is normal, water levels are generally high across the, uh, all of the resources. And then pumpage is actually below. So when we had the pandemic last year, the um, production, it dropped. And um, so it, it's, it's, below that. So um, at least this is an average for the month though. So not quite a good comparison, but anyway, that's the report. Um, if, I, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Members, any questions for Mr. Uh, just a quick, quick question. Um, uh, this is Roger. Uh, Barry, I see the uh, the moving average, uh, five-year moving average, is somewhere between 130 to 150 million gallons a day, depending on the time of year. Right. Approximately. Yes. So, um, what what was that number, say, 20 years ago? It was it was quite a bit higher, right? Am I right? Yes. Yeah. We were. Um, Averaging like right now, I think we're averaging in the 140s. It was 155, as I remember, moving average. In August of 2003, we had a we had a high of 181 MGD, um, and and so we we're pumping a lot more 20 years ago. But because of conservation and and more educational awareness, I think. Um, Production has uh, decreased significantly, so um, it bodes very well for the resource. Um, so, so, resource. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Certainly. And if I could just add to that, since um, Roger raised this issue, I just want to really give props to the staff um, and to the leadership. 
I mean, I've been working on water issues eh, probably for the last 20 years or so. And when most of the other counties were looking at ramping up supply, um, our BWS doubled down on looking at conservation management and demand side management, and that's made a significant difference for us. So mahalo to um, Barry and Ernie in particular for your folks' leadership in this area. Mahalo. Thank you, and to our customers for conserving. So thank you. All right. Any more questions, mm -hmm. anybody? Hey, Joel. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sigal, for the report. Thanks, guys. Um, next uh, on the agenda, items for information is item number four. We've got the water main repair report for March 2021. Um, our friend Mr. Fouke is not here today, um, so we uh, have um, Mr. Jason Nikaido. Hi, good afternoon, Chair and Board Members. Um, I'm Jason Nikaido. I am the Assistant Program Administrator for Field Operations, and I'll be giving the March uh, main break report uh, for Mike Fouquet. So in March of 2021, um, we had 23 main breaks, and that brings us to a total of 265 um, for the fiscal year. Um, and on average, our main breaks were repaired in uh, 14 hours. Um, for the leak detection side, our leak, de our leak detection team investigated 18 miles and found 43 leaks in March. Um, 41 leaks uh, were coupling leaks. Um, and that concludes uh, the main break report. Are there any questions? Members, any questions? Okay, if not, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nikaido, for the report. Um, hopefully, we can keep the number down um, for the next few months. Yes. All right, that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. Uh, we do have executive session today. Um, may I have a motion uh, to? Um, Go into executive session. So moved. This is Ray. I second. Okay, it's been moved by Member Butai and seconded by Member Soon um, to go into executive session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, all those, thank you. All those, all those, say name. Okay. Reflect, uh, that we have a unanimous um, uh, sense and uh, let's uh, prepare for executive session. Okay, um, a motion to uh, adjourn, please. So move. I mean, I really enjoyed this one, but I, I would love to adjourn. <laughs> okay, I moved by member Soon. Is there a second? A second, Jay. No, I moved it. Okay. Oh, Jay did. Okay, seconded by member Kutai. All those in favor um, to adjourn the meeting, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All right. Um, we are adjourned. We stand adjourned. Thank you very much.